of the four boards, one of them up until this year had always been assessing our cybersecurity risk through our risk committees. We started finding that we were spending an awful lot of time at the risk committee speaking about cyber risk and less about organizational risk and financial risk and reputational risk to the point that three of the four boards that I sat on this year have created a specific IT technology committee focused mostly, I would say, on risk, on cyber risk, although we look at other technology uh, issues around the table. And we did this because we realized that we were taking so much time from all the other risks that we weren't giving ample time to cyber. And everyone agreed that it is increasing, Jeff, as you were saying, in terms of frequency in terms of the dollars spent. And as you might imagine, the board is looking at every dollar and how we're spending it. And if we're increasing our insurance premiums and we're spending more concern about ransomware, we needed to focus specifically on cyber risk. So again, of the four boards I'm on, all four boards have created a specific risk committee meeting that is focused wholly on cybersecurity and managing to that end. We approach it from like a protect, detect, and respond perspective. So as part of, uh, we have a couple of different things we undertake, but the first place we look at from a governance risk and compliance standpoint is we're conducting regular recurring risk reviews and tracking all items via risk register. So it's just one way for us to collect information about ongoing risks or newly discovered risks from people at the ground level. And then we bubble those up based on risk scoring to the executive. Another one is that we've included cyber risk as part of our BCDR planning. So now we're doing a test for that on an annual basis. So we're coming up to the next set of tests in 2023. So that'll be incorporated as part of that. On top of that, we work with a variety of vendors to ensure that we have good vulnerability management, threat intel, dark web monitoring, some of our assessment and detection methods to ensure that even though we're not out in the wild, we've got people keeping an eye on stuff to see if there's any hint of a potential uh, either targeting or a potential breach. And then we work closely with our parent company to uh, enforce and uh, align with the different security frameworks that they're using to ensure that we don't have any blind spots and that we're continuing to investigate evolving areas of risk. So we got a couple of different approaches. We think about it in terms of really two dimensions. You know, the, the first is you've got to have the right controls in place to shrink shrink your attack surface, to reduce your risk. Uh, you know, and pl- there are plenty of great frameworks. I think it really depends on your, your industry that you're in. And, you know, you, you just, you want to have something that's going to really govern that approach. And we can talk more about that. That's really that proactive level of investment that helps you measure understand, hey, here's my attack surface. This is what I need. Here's how we want to think about shrinking that down and and maturing our security process over over time. The other element, though, is is much more dynamic. And and for us, you know, as we observe the the attackers, the criminals operating in the space, and I agree with Helen, I think, you know, we, we continue to index on cybersecurity risks just because of the outcomes that we're seeing in our in our industries. We look now at how can we do threat modeling and understand these adversary behaviors, understand how they're going to impact our systems on an hourly or, or minute by minute basis? So we're really now trying to move into a much more continuous assessment, continuous testing and adaptation, because we're beginning to see these adversaries adopt very dynamic techniques and really use speed to their advantage. So there's the the proactive element where you're really looking at those controls, measuring, and you, you've got a plan that you're working through as part of your risk management program. But then there's you know the much more dynamic cat and mouse game where we want to move to a much more continuous test and adaptation posture. And there we're looking at, hey, do we understand the threat that's facing the organization? And then within that threat envelope, let's continuously test so that we're monitoring for those adversary capabilities when they develop a new exploit or roll something out, do we have the controls in place that can be effective at that, against that? If not, 
great, let's make an adaptation very quickly within that cycle. So, you know, we think about it in terms of more static testing and now much more dynamic measurement and testing. And I think you've got to have a combination of those two, given the dynamism of the, the risks. Incident response playbook plus a number of things. So in our playbook, it's about the preparation to, to be very ready and effective when that incident happens, right? Predefine what are the potentials. And secondly, the detection analysis and the re reporting. The third one is triage and analysis. When that happens, what is the triage process? What are the actions that we need to take to, to contain, to mitigate and like stop some of the application? And lastly is the recover. So when post-incident happens, what are the things that we need to follow up? So that's a list of playbook. But also on the other side, just a playbook is not enough, right? So you need a group of talent with both business and technical skills. You need to have uh, all the internal external communications. You know, you need to know who you need to reach out. Is there any regulatory bodies, OSFI or insurance company? Who are the contacts that you need to reach out when those things happen? You also need to have a very customer-centric mindset, making those decisions throughout this incident management process. Lastly, continue to have the tabletop exercise to make sure the process you define is practical. And when things happen, you just not uh, running as headless chickens. I think organization uh, should characterize the non-security issue and vulnerability that cannot immediately be remediated. Like, most organizations, I'm sure, that have legacy application, they have system that is still learning on the end of support platform and cannot be patched. Believe me, I'm living with them. So we also have to, have to know that this most vulnerable asset that we have uh, are crown jewels. So we need to focus on those assets, know that where they reside, what is the impact to them if security incident happened to those critical infrastructure and data we have. Another thing is that all organizations must have incident response plan, and the plan will help them uh, minimize the duration and also the, the damage of the security incidents. I was looking at the recent survey that was published, uh, which shows that 77% of organizations have no formal incident response plan. This is very concerning. And not that you need only to have the plan, we also need to conduct a regular training and reviewing to make sure that the plan is effective and current. Um, as, um, as Janet mentioned, uh, this requires collaboration and coordination across multiple departments. You need to work with their compliance, privacy, legal, communication teams. And if everybody has a clear idea ahead of time um, about the roles and responsibility during the incident time, things will run smoothly, believe me. You also need to engage third party to assess your team response capability and also your readiness. Through this exercise, you can understand the, the potential gap that your existing processes and technology have. And Janet mentioned that for the playbooks, you need to develop uh, as many as playbooks for different type of incidents, like ransomware, email compromise, phishing, site defacement, third party breaches. So if you have those one handies, it's gonna be much um, effective uh, when you're actually dealing with the, with the incident in the case of incident. We do, by nature of our work, we do have a strong security community and escalation process methods that pre-existed before even the pandemic. So it is a legal requirement. So we've had that. We do have somebody, well, two people 24-7 looking after this component. And there is an escalation process and there is a playbook which is revised on almost a weekly basis just to make sure this is practical. We've kind of developed our own method for the you know, securing the service security, which has also been ongoing for the now the last three years. I would say that it is a very significant component. We've noticed that uh, the breaches are becoming more during the last year, post the pandemic, but we've also been prepared updating our escalation process and so on. It's a requirement being the emergency support. 
in addition to planning and testing and having a very good cyber stack, one of the things that really strikes me as critical is the service level agreements. The SLAs, who does what when, what's the orchestration between different parties, who steps in in what case, making sure that the predefined workflows are not only well understood and tested, but they do attest also to the importance and criticality of a particular incident. It's not something that can be handled by just one vendor or just the business itself. It's really a shared responsibility. So having predefined, pre-tested, pre-vetted SLAs um, comes very handy. And in addition also, the companies, we do carry cyber insurance. So having good partnership, established relationships with those 911 vendors, that also comes help, uh, very helpful because we know what to expect from them and we know what, how we can help them to help us. So from that perspective, you know, being the, the conductor of the perfect orchestra, it's something that really comes to my mind as, as critical for success. 